Hi, I'm Darlene Carmen. Welcome to the show. Both of my guests today are authors. Elisa Clevin's children's picture books are filled with whimsical illustrations of mixed media. Elaine Miller Bond's books are laced with photography that speaks without volumes. Uh, today we will discover what motivates and inspires their work. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks, it's great to be here. Good to have you again. Nice to see you, Darlene. Yeah. So now, Elisa, you mm -hmm. have published like 30 books. Uh, wow. <laughs> so what motivates you to keep writing? I just can't help myself. I find <laughs> inspiration everywhere, and I see the world almost in a childlike way where I'm always um, endowing a spirit or a soul to things in, in my world, from animals to insects to inanimate objects like gingerbread people or paper dolls. So I think it's just part of my worldview that has it's very connected to my childhood. I think I think we have a sample here. You mentioned paper dolls. Oh right. Um, yeah, this, this one. <laughs> I saw this, and it's like, is is this what you mean? Like this well, one? this is a book I created as an adult about a paper princess, a paper doll, and mm -hmm. um, a little girl. I'm often children will make their own creations based on my stories. So I didn't actually make this. Rachel from Room 5 made it. But oh. I get these charming responses from kids. She made this yes. and then that inspired you to make this book? It's actually the other way around. I, <laughs> sorry, it's confusing. I used to constantly make paper dolls when I was young. When I became an adult, I made a picture book about making paper dolls, about a little girl who makes a paper doll who's magical and comes to life and blows away. And this has inspired other children to make their own. So it's, I love how it's come full circle with now, the audience interacting, my, not audience, but my readers interacting with my stories and bringing them to life. And I remember that, you know, talking with you before, that mm -hmm. you had your own like doll houses. You, you did this from a child. Tell, tell us about that. When I was about maybe four or five, I started creating a miniature world inside of my uh, closet and <laughs> in the shelves where there should have been clothes. I put all sorts of characters that I would make from, from, pa from, I would make them out of everything from paper to clay to walnut shells to dried apples and they all had <laughs> souls and stories and, and I would make little landscapes for them to live in. Oh. And so I was constantly in this magical miniature world of my own. Did this all come from like the reading that you've done as a child? Is this something that grew from like, you know, your imagination from reading other books? Yes, reading oh. had a lot to do with it and mm. wishing, because I would hear stories say The Wizard of Oz. And even though it was kind of scary when Dorothy's house lifts off in the cyclone and goes to Oz, I thought, wouldn't that be cool to visit Oz for the day, you know? Mm. Or Peter Pan, I wished that Peter Pan would fly through my window and sprinkle <laughs> me with fairy dust and take me flying. So it kind of grew out of al almost envy for these real kids, in the, or fictional kids, but they seemed real to me that were always going to these magical places. Mm. I wanted to find Narnia in my house, open a wardrobe door and suddenly step into a, a magical snowy wow. world. But I didn't find Narnia. Instead, I made my own little Narnias and Wonderlands and Neverlands in my closet. So as you grew up and everything developed, mm -hmm. then for a short amount of time, I don't know how long, you were actually a fourth grade teacher. Yes, I was. And then what happened there? You, I mean, I'm sure you're a really great teacher, but that writing urge probably. Well, it was always there. And one summer, um, I decided to just try writing a children's picture book. And I collected some ideas and made them into a little, it's called a book dummy, a rough draft of the book. Yeah. Yes. And I made a few sample illustrations and started sending them out and getting some rejections, but some nibbles too. So things just fell into place from there. But and then you just, it just took over? It did take the over. The writing just <laughs> took over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes. well, you're teaching actually within the writing. I mean, you know, let's Thank face you, it. Thank you. But, but I mean. It's a balancing act. And yeah. I still love kids a lot. I had some of my own and now they're grown up, but I still do art classes at home and with young children. and. Today, actually, it's we were making gingerbread related. houses, so oh, that oh, was it's, fun. It's all related. <laughs> yes, it all kind of <laughs> flows into each other, well, all the things. What about your fans? I mean, I know you have both children and adults, mm -hmm. so do they help encourage your efforts to keep writing? Well, they are. They lift my spirits. <laughs> writing and illustrating can be isolating, so when I get a, a lovely little paper doll like that, or a mother says, or a father said, we took the kids to San Francisco, and we 
we're reading some of your, you know, landmarks in my next book, which we'll talk about in a bit. But um, yes, it's always inspiring. Or if I help somebody out through my stories, a lot of them are sort of about emotional issues in a subtle way. And sometimes they make people feel less lonely or scared or confused. So you get social <laughs> media too. I imagine yes. you get a lot of feedback in that way too, right? I'm lucky because fans will contact me on Facebook. I'm only on Facebook. I'm still sort of a, a, a <laughs> last century person. So hmm. even going on that was a big step for me. But now I'm very much on it. You know, I check in and it's nice to communicate with readers and with people who like my yeah, art. I would say so. So now your latest book, The Horribly Hungry Gingerbread Boy. Did I say that right? <laughs> so this is your latest book. Mm -hmm. Really, really nice. And um, you just, it's amazing how you keep coming up. This was a classic tale mm -hmm. that had an unhappy ending. <laughs> and then you come along and you give it like a happy ending twist with a positive twist. Can you refresh our memory about the original tale and why you decided to change it, make it happy? Well, as you might recall, the gingerbread boy was made by a, a little old woman. I think in most stories, in most versions of the story, a little old woman and man want a child, but they can't have one. So they make one out of cookie dough. And hmm. he's a very cute little gingerbread boy. And he, as soon as he's baked, he jumps right off the baking pan and runs out of the house and into the wide world. And he is just happy to be in the world, running around. But of course, he smells delicious and looks very yummy, and everybody who sees him wants to eat him. So he's being pursued by all sorts of hungry people and even animals. I remember one Whoa. version where the cows are chasing him and the horses, and I, wow. <laughs> and he always he's taunting them and saying, "Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm that. the gingerbread man." Remember that? I remember that. <laughs> and then he reaches a river and he can't run any farther. He's trapped. He's made of cookie dough, so he'll disintegrate, and he doesn't know how to swim. And Aww. the fox steps in and says, jump on my back, little gingerbread man, and I'll take you to safety. But this is a trick, because as soon as he jumps on the fox's back, he reaches up and grabs him in his jaws, and that's the end. And I remember looking at the last, the last page of my book was just the startled, betrayed-looking little character. Yes, he's made out of cookie dough, but when you're four years old or three or five, you think of them as real people. They have yes. eyes and noses and mouths and talk and they have emotions so I felt very sad oh, oh. <laughs> no, but also I liked the story and in my later years I decided to heal my <laughs> early wounds <laughs> and go back and give it a happy ending where the gingerbread boy not only doesn't get eaten but he wants to eat everything else <laughs> because he does have a mouth but I've never seen a hungry gingerbread in all the versions of the story I've seen there have been a lot of sort of spins and twists on the tail yeah. One of them where he's hungry too, so yeah. I made mine hungry. Mm. So that was like, uh, I think I read it was like something like 1875, the original story, the classic. Wow. I actually don't quite remember <laughs> the story, but I do remember Run As Fast As You Can. That's right. the line that I really remembered. But your your story, you know, I, I won't say anything, of course, I, won't, I wouldn't say the ending, but, you know, it's a happy ending and it's also uh, rewarding because, you know, they kind of like make something right, which I won't go into, but I really like that. Thank you. Uh, another thing I like about your book is that you have a well-rounded approach mm -hmm. to some of your stories, mm -hmm. where uh, I remember the apple doll when mm -hmm. I was with you before, like eight mm -hmm. years ago. And I like what you do because sometimes, in some of your stories, you like tell the story and then you mm -hmm. color it with your artwork and then you add these supplements Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what you're thinking about adding these things for, in your books. What do they do for the children? Well, it makes the book come to life in a way, and it makes them participants in the story. They can make their own paper doll or gingerbread boy or apple doll or sun bread. I have a book called Sun Bread where you can, there's a recipe for how to make a, a bread like that. So I just remember being so moved and inspired by the stories I loved that I wanted to keep kind of playing with the characters. And this way, I have tools that help the children do well, that. Well, let's see. OK, so we have, we don't need to see it up close, but we do have a recipe here, how to make gingerbread people. Can we see yours? Oh, in honor of the book, I made a, a bigger than usual gingerbread boy. <laughs> <laughs> He's fresh baked. He smells good. 
Um, but I do have a recipe for tinier gingerbread people. Yes, and now this recipe, it's a real recipe. So is it your recipe? I combined a few favorite recipes and tested sure. them. And Oh, you tested them? Oh, yes, I did. Test <laughs> I like to bake. Yeah. <laughs> I like sweets, too. So, wow. yeah, it was fun. Well, he's very tempting, and Elaine and I would love to have a sample, but you know you we're gonna we're gonna pass to just <laughs> enjoy the, <laughs> the he's for now. Totally edible and fresh. She hasn't been sitting around for a long time. So, so now in this book, it is about San Francisco, mm -hmm. and from what I understand, you can like see the Golden Gate Bridge from your house. Well, I live in the East Bay, right across mm -hmm. from San Francisco, mm -hmm. and I can see from my bedroom window the Golden Gate Bridge, which I love seeing out there. It's pretty small from my angle, but it's there. <laughs> wow. Well, you have some really nice landmarks in San Francisco, and so we'd like to show a couple here. So what are we looking at here? Oh, that's Lombard Street. Uh -huh. And the gingerbread boy sees everything as, as something to be eaten. Everything is edible. <laughs> and his, he's brand new to the world. And he says, I'll eat a ribbon candy street. I'll spoon up fog like cream of wheat. <laughs> so he's <laughs> noshing on the city there very gleefully. Because the Lombard Street just looks like ribbon candy to me. Yeah, but see, I see like the Palace of Fine Arts mm -hmm. here. And there's so much detail. That's what I really, really like about these. Uh, now, this one everyone should understand easily, which is the cable car. Mm -hmm. And where are we here? Oh, you're on the cable car overlooking, uh, not far from Girardelli Square. That's um, Aquatic Park with the old ships. There's Alcatraz. Ah. There's the Bay Bridge. And oh. he's drinking a milkshake there. And who doesn't love San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all love San Francisco. So you're, so I should say what we're looking at is original art here. Mm -hmm. So you have, you work in, I think you said that you draw sometimes in ink your people and then you use watercolor and collage. So what else? What, I mean, that's color I pencils? Everything that works for me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I don't use oil paint. That's a whole different thing. Oh, but oh. I use lots of different art supplies. This is one of my favorite places up here in the corner, and this is the Arboretum. Thank you. Arboretum here. So, um, you know, I got that right. So, the Arboretum. And um, they have big lilies there and so forth. And here's, of course, our gingerbread guy. So one thing that you do with your illustrations is that you have a lot of uh, movement. And mm -hmm. I also read about your artwork that they, it's like uh, not more like flying, not mm -hmm. dancing, more like I would say dancing. Mm -hmm. You would say Both. flying. Yeah. <laughs> OK, dancing just briefly, flying. we'll have a couple more here. So this is Coit Tower. Yeah. yeah. You're going to eat that too? He wants to eat up the oh, city. My goodness. He loves it so much. Coit Tower. <laughs> And one more, which is... Um, That's Golden Gate Park yes. in the Tea Garden. Yes. The, the drum bridge. It's the beautiful arching bridge in the Tea Garden that children love to climb on, including the gingerbread boy he likes to uh, climb I on. recognize this right away. And of course, <laughs> going for the stone bridges and all that stuff is really nice. Well, wonderful, wonderful artwork. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that Thanks with us. very much. Now, Elaine, you're a wildlife <laughs> photographer. And... You, um, you'll see, oh, we have your first book. First time you were with us, you were experiencing the prairie dogs in a collaboration of a book with? Dr. Theodore Mano. Okay, and so that was your first uh, book. So then at that time you were on the show though, you were talking about your first in a series of books with, board books, with Heyday Publishing. Yeah, in, Heyday um, Books, yeah. Berkeley, right? Berkeley? That's right. Okay. So just, um, so this is a board book. And um, is this a good one to show? I think it's cute. Yeah, this is a board book called Running Wild. I'm so glad that it's my first book from Heyday Books. It came out last September. And it's all about how do you like to move your body. It's a how book. So do you like to swim? Or maybe you'd rather prance like a deer. Um, this is actually the photo that started the book. Um, mm -hmm. I was at Point Reyes National Seashore 
and I took a picture of this deer. Aww. And it looked so forward moving, it made me want to prance. Mm -hmm. So I went home, I pranced home, I guess you mm. could say. And I drew up a list of all these fun action verbs, like slink and slither and slide and pounce. <laughs> I even, that's pounce there, that's the coyote. And I made up a list of dream animals that I thought could be represented in these verbs. I even made a list of animals that I'd never seen before, like the critically endangered California condor. The condor, and the condor is yeah. in here at the it back, is. right? It's in the middle. And in the middle. <laughs> the, interesting, the interesting thing about the condor is after she took flight condor? and represented the word soar. Condor. <laughs> it's a very critically endangered animal, and I took this picture actually in Pinnacles National Park, not that oh, far from here. Love that place. And if you look on the next page, okay. she took to the air and she started spiraling up with a group of turkey Wait vultures. For it. Wait for it. It's coming. <laughs> and this is the moment when the condor was flying with the turkey vulture that it made me think oh. it's more fun to be on the move with friends. Oh. And it's so, all about motion. It's this all, about, is all motion. about motion. And then your follow-up book, because it's a series of three, your follow-up book is, we'll show the illustrations in a minute, um, is um, Living, Living Wild? Wild. Living Wild. Okay. So what I wanted to ask you is I wanted to ask you, what are you trying to do to help the children connect with nature? I know that that's what you're up to, but in your own words, what are you really trying to, how are you doing this? Well, I'm trying to make nature accessible and inspirational because there's so much bad news out there about the environment. When yes. we hear about global climate change, when we see that picture of an ice flow with a single polar bear drifting mm. off, yes. a habitat loss, poaching, the list goes on and on. So, you know, in my experience, the people that have gone out and made the biggest difference, the people like Dr. John Hoagland who worked with the prairie dogs and the people who go and observe elephant seals every day, they do so because they love them. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to do with my message is to make animals lovable, accessible, something that we might see, and just to use love as the motivating factor. Not, I think that... Uh, Hatred, anger, depression can only motivate one so far, but I think mm -hmm. if you instill a love in children at a young age, they will grow up and for their whole lives they will love nature and wildlife. Mm. Now one thing that you're always trying to do is you're always trying to find the next big adventure, and you did that with a white hummingbird, and you told me that this is not a species. So let's see some of your pictures, and then you can tell us about Oh, them. yes. Um, the white hummingbird, this is a white hummingbird. It's not an albino because if you notice, the eye is black, the bill is black, and the skin is black. What it's called is leucistic, leucism, as opposed to albinism, like oh. for an albino. Yes. So it's a very, very rare uh, condition that can affect different types of animals. In this case, it affected this hummingbird was born with it. Uh, Wow. And this was in the Arboretum in Santa Cruz. I had actually heard that a white hummingbird had been seen last spring when I was in the Arboretum. Well, that's a needle in a haystack. So yeah. I looked around. I didn't see it. But uh, about a couple months later in September, the hummingbird had been seen more and more. So I decided I was going to go and try and get my <laughs> photo of it. Uh. So I got up before dawn. I went down there. I actually left my sandwich on my kitchen counter, so I had no lunch, I had no water, but I stood out there for about eight or nine hours to get this shot. Eight or nine hours. Yeah. And then this, this is a, you told me this is a banksia, right? The, I think it's, plant? I think that's what the plant is. I think you're right. Yeah, this is another shot of the same bird. It's and a beautiful place. This, this arboretum is wonderful. That's right. And yeah. that's the thing about shooting wildlife. You never know when to say when. You know, when have you gotten the shot? When is it time to go home? And I just figured I might as well. I stayed there for several hours. I might as well stay until closing. And it was yeah. just a few minutes before closing that I got those two shots. And, and the it was next a, one? Yeah, and the next shot, it's the next concept uh, in my series. It's called Wild Colors. Mm. The first book is Running Wild. It's a how book. It's how do you like to move your body? My second book is Living Wild. Where is your favorite place? Well, this book is a what book? What is your favorite color? 
What is your favorite color? Right, and so the next two slides are showing just a couple of my favorite pictures from inside the book. Um, Look at those blue eggs. Oh, yeah, those blue I eggs. Think of robins, you know. <laughs> yeah, those are robins eggs. Oh, they are. Well, good. <laughs> and um, this is just what I would call like a book dummy, you know, mm -hmm. a sample cover. Mm -hmm. It's the type of thing I might go to Heyday Books to my editor there and pitch to her. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so the the next picture is um, another garden shot. This is sort of in my theme of making things accessible. I know that children love little things like honeybees and bumblebees and flowers. They look for the small things in gardens, and gardens can be a great inspiration even for wildlife photography. Is this also from the Arboretum or somewhere else? This is from Heather Farm Park in Walnut Creek. Huh. The next shot is a garden shot as well. It's uh, from the UC Berkeley Botanical oh. Garden. This oh. is an autumnal shot. Oh. We were talking about robin's eggs. Well, this is the adult robin. and. Uh, this is uh, representing our world of many colors. <laughs> mm. And then I do continue to go out. Sometimes I don't go as close as a garden. I might go as far as the Florida Everglades. And wow. um, in the next picture, we'll see my best shot, my Ooh. favorite shot I probably took all year. This is from the Florida Everglades. <sighs> like when I went out with the uh, white hummingbird, I went out with the target species. I thought. Uh, this is an animal I really want to go see. And I went specifically for the white hummingbird. In the case of the Everglades, you know, you go there for alligators. Yes, or but flamingos. Or... The nice thing is to be open to the experience, to look and read what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And I happened to go down to this area by the seashore, and I spotted a nest not far from the parking lot, and I spent about a couple hours observing the nest. And in the next shot, is another action shot. These <laughs> are a little closer to home. These are gray foxes in Coyote Hills Regional Park in Fremont. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I love your action shots. That's what I always love about your photography. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sometimes I call myself a sports photographer for wildlife. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's very good, yes. <laughs> the next shot shows another kind of interaction. This is a more tender interaction uh -huh. between a an older mule deer fawn and the mother. This was in Sequoia National Park. And then for my last image, I put in one that I knew that you'd like the best, <laughs> a little black bear cub. The little oh. black bear cub was in <laughs> Yellowstone National Park. Oh, oh precious. He's just, oh, just adorable. So by chance, will we be seeing that white hummingbird in one of your future books? We might, perhaps in Wild Colors, the one that's coming out next year. Oh, well, I'll be looking forward to that. Um, Elisa, I'd like to touch on another book here. You have so many books. And by the way, not only do you write your own, but you also illustrate for other authors. Mm -hmm. So you're not just doing your own. Anyway, I'd like to touch on this book here, The Glass Wings, mm -hmm. A Butterfly. Um, I may have seen this in a, a butterfly house. I'm not I'm looking for it. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. I want to show people the real butterfly um, and your image. Okay. So yours would be, uh, this is the real one, and yours would be on the opposite side. Yes. Um, I really don't know if I've ever seen one of these. I think it says yeah, it's from South America or? Uh, yes, South and Central America in the rainforest. Mm. In the rainforest. Mm -hmm. um, so, let's see. It has no pigments in the scales, is that right? Right, yes. So They're it's clear. transparent. Yes. And then in your illustrations, of course, I, I don't know where to begin. They're all so wonderful. <sighs> but, um, uh, is this good? Is sure. this a good one here? Okay, I'm going to show the whole shot here. And just to, to give you an idea on the different colors it takes on because it's transparent. So this one went up to a, a stoplight. Uh, she and gets there you blown go. off course. She's far, <laughs> a wind takes her from the beautiful rainforest and the flowers, and she's trying to find color in the city. Yeah, yeah. She's lost her colorful identity, so she goes... <laughs> in front of the stoplight and changes color. That's amazing. So it, it has a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Of course, I kind of would kind of expect that from you. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen one of these for real? 
I've seen photos. I uh -huh. have to confess I haven't. But yeah. The first time I saw a photo one, I, of one, I said, I have to make a story about that because it seemed like something oh. right out of a fairy tale. Mm. And the more I researched them, the more fairy tale-like they, they became. I just, I don't so. know if I've ever seen one or not. I'm sure they're probably very small. They're pretty small, yes, but not really teeny tiny. Maybe about like this. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I like about your books, though, is there's just so much details. I wish I could point out things, but I just mm -hmm. can't. It's just too much, but it's wonderful. <laughs> um, so just keep writing. It's Thank really you. wonderful. Um, Elaine, I wanted to ask you, uh, where are you going next year on this big adventure? I'm sure you're going somewhere. Are you, where are you going? Well, some of the places I'm going are the desert. The desert. Because I'm really inspired by the desert. In fact, the desert is featured in my second book, Living Wild, where it's all about place. So which desert? Do you know? On the Mojave Desert. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mojave. And I went to a lot of places this last year, so I'm sort of slowing down a little bit next year. I'm going to see where the wind takes me. But I'm also focusing on our local California environments, you know, being in line with the seasons. Like this is the time of year for sandhill cranes and snow geese. And in the spring, I'll turn on to wildflowers and go down to the Death Valley, and then in the summer, and so forth. Oh, I didn't realize that you traveled so much with your ventures. Now, of course, I know with your prairie dogs you did, but I didn't know that you really traveled that much. Um, there's so much beauty everywhere you turn to, and photography. But to see that white, now I have seen a lot of specials, including hummingbird specials, on the channels. <clears throat> I won't say which one, right. and um, that we all know and love, and I've never seen a white hummingbird. So my hat's off to both of you guys. I want to thank you so much for thank being you. here. Oh, thank and you. And I hope that, that this has inspired you to understand and get a greater appreciation for what it takes to be an author, especially a children's book author. You have to have the skills. You have to have the creative energy and the heart to make it happen. And so um, I just want to say to everybody out there, to all of the authors that write fiction and nonfiction that are writing quality books, hats off to you. We salute you. And if you're just getting started, please, everybody has a voice. And there's children out there that want to read what you have to say. Thanks for watching the show. Watch again.